Uh, thank you very much for the lovely introduction. I'm delighted to be here and give a talk at the M12 Summer School. So I will uh, present today work we are conducting on personalized longitudinal natural language processing. But first I will start by introducing some natural language processing fundamentals and then move on to uh, progress we're making in this field. So anyway, there will be three parts to, to the talk. So one will be on an introduction to natural language processing, and, uh, and then I will have some paradigms on learning paradigms uh, for, for NLP. And then I'll move on to kind of the, 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 group, the work we're doing in the group on personalized uh, longitudinal natural language processing. So first, I'd like to start by saying a few things um, about the broader area of natural language processing. So I don't know how many of you have studied NLP, but um, it's the field that studies computational methods for getting computers to perform a useful tasks involving human language and identifying also structure uh, in text. And it's also concerned uh, with the kinds of insights that such computational work gives us about human processing of language as well. And methodologically, there are important overlaps with machine learning. Uh, which, as most of you will have figured out by now and know, it's the field of computer science that gives computers the ability to learn without being explicitly programmed. So, um, however, NLP uh, was not always machine learning. So it's uh, in the early days, especially it involved creating rules and grammars and knowledge resources. So an important aspect of natural language processing, which distinguishes it, from machine learning is how to actually represent and encode language and human knowledge um, and um, incorporate this into language technology. And the language data can be from a huge variety of sources, so anything we can find online, news articles, scientific articles, social media, but also things like health records, employment records, CVs, transcribed conversations. So there's a huge uh, array of um, different kinds of language data and uh, and here what sort of this diagram shows you is that NLP is part of the whole uh, data life cycle from experiment design so how you operationalize a, a, a problem to result interpretation so it's involving in steps from deciding how to how you formulate a particular problem how you represent the data how you incorporate human knowledge and insights, and then how you train the model to perform um, various tasks. So in the words of Chris Manning, uh, who's a very well-known um, leading uh, internationally leading NLP professor from Stanford, um, our field is the domain of uh, language technology. It's not about the best performing machine learning methods, the central issue remains the domain uh, problems and the domain's problems will not go away. So more of the field's efforts should go into problems, approaches and architectures. So this is quite nice to have because it means there's a lot of stuff to do beyond what is the fanciest uh, language model and technology to use. So I'll give you a, now a very brief history of NLP. So it started in the 1940s and the goal was machine translation. So it's all, all started with the goal of machine translation, which is kind of the core driving force of NLP. And it gained momentum in the 1980s with a lot of the parallel corpora, uh, the, in the EU parallel corpora, and a lot of the work, the field back then was mainly called computational linguistics, and people were working on grammars uh, and ways of representing meaning. Then there's been a rapid expansion from the 1990s with the wide adoption of the internet and the availability of large scale documents. And then from 2000 and onward, the, the field has shifted from symbolic methods, so grammars and rules, to being uh, hugely statistical and uh, machine learning based. And from 2000 and onwards, the last 23 years, it's very much machine learning based. Uh, now, sort of the really seminal developments came 10, year, 10 years ago with uh, this paper on word to vec which I'll mention briefly in the next slides. Uh, and then this changed how we actually represent uh, the unstructured text. 
And then the next big breakthrough was in 2017. I've got 18, but it's actually 2017 with uh, the notion of attention and transformers. And so basically, this has been really the major development that has led to uh, what we now have, uh, these large language models. They're, they're all based on sort of um, versions of transformer architectures and some uh, multi-head attention. So, um, so why is NLP important as a field? Uh, so yes, uh, there's a large, there's a large amount of knowledge available in, um, in, in natural language. So it's, it's really important to be able to actually process this automatically. Uh, conversational agents are becoming an important form of human computer communication. Um, and indeed, uh, a, lot of, a lot of you will have played with um, systems like ChatGPT. And there's a lot that you can do with these kinds of uh, conversational systems. And much of human human communication is now mediated by computers. So look at machine translation now. So you're um, you're able to travel to any country and actually use machine translation and, and be able to to communicate in many ways. So what can we do with NLP? So we can do a huge number of tasks. Uh, just to name a few. So we have classification tasks such as sentiment analysis, uh, where where you want to assign. Um, uh, a particular label to, to let's say, a sentence, uh, other types of text classification. So you, you may, for example, want to classify documents uh, as reviews or case studies. Um, we can do uh, question answering, um, as I mentioned with, with chatbots, we can do machine translation, fact verification, text summarization, information extraction, uh, document search. So um, just, um, kind of broadly, there's, there's sort of these more low level tasks and higher level tasks and sort of things like text generation, where we have summarization and dialogue systems are, um, are part of the higher level um, applications in NLP. And, and of course, there are a lot of commercial applications. So this is just a very few um, logos of, of companies, some of which have an NLP history. Uh, and some of which entered uh, the sort of uh, NLP, like like Amazon and Bloomberg, who who later all have um, have got uh, NLP uh, very good NLP groups. Um, and and obviously the appeal is to be able to do social media analytics, uh, recommender systems, um, and these days most large organizations, so organizations. Um, like the BBC, um, the government departments, banks, and other um, financial organizations will have NLP teams. So it's becoming a, sort of a, uh, an expertise that is being used in, in very many different uh, domains and areas. So I don't know whether I, I need to give you some examples, but just as an example of what you can do, you have uh, this article in Greek, and then you can translate it in English and uh, find out about Sort of the local news. Uh, you can do web question answering and, of course, uh, more elaborate question answering with systems like ChatGPT. And so, and perhaps uh, an application you don't know so much about is, is around rumor verification. So, if there's information circulating on social media, how do you decide that this is actually a um, whether the, the claims that are being circulated are actually true? And what kind of evidence do you have uh, to, to identify what is happening? So why is it challenging? Um, so it's been challenging because language is ambiguous. So if I say I went to the bank, it could be uh, the financial institution or it could be the bank of a river. Uh, there's grammatical ambiguities. So visiting relatives can be exhausting. So are these are the relatives exhausting or is it the act uh, or visiting relatives exhausting. So all of these problems have actually um, played a, a big role in processing text automatically for a while. Uh, so language is, is in flux, it's constantly changing. So things like neologisms, so unfriend and selfie, new terms crop up all the time. 
So how do we find out what they mean? Uh, you have idioms like under the weather. So you need, need to be able to, you can't have uh, static ways of saying uh, or representing these. So you have to constantly be um, updating your representations. You have multi-word expressions. Um, there's, uh, there's a lot of variability. So there's typos, learner mistakes, and also people's dis disfluencies and individual styles, uh, especially if you're working with social media or um, transcribed text or, or um, speech. And of course, there's metaphors. So all of these are continuing to be challenging despite the great uh, advances we've made. Um, there's, a, there's complex linguistic phenomena such, such as uh, the student arrived on time, but the professor had already left. So there, um, you know, you, you have this, this, the connection between the two sentences, um, between the discourse, so the, the connector, the but connector. Um, ellipsis and anaphora, so all of these, um, I'm going and so are you. So there's all these complex linguistic phenomena. So we've made a lot of progress in NLP, uh, especially in text classification, but also in translation and generation with recent large language models. Um, uh, and, and I think that my colleague who comes later will talk to you about, more about um, large language models, but I'll say a few things. Um, so there are still important missing elements, however. So dealing with small and sparse data and transferring knowledge across domains and incorporating background knowledge or linguistic structure is still something that uh, we can't do very well with these uh, with the large language models. So there's been an increasing acceleration on this front with recent emphasis on ways of working with small data, such as few shot learning and different kinds of prompt learning strategies. Um, interpretation is a big issue. So how are we, uh, we, we learn these representations of language, but how do we obtain uh, representations that are interpretable and how do we make sure that we can justify decisions made by uh, language models? Um, how do we deal with model fairness and how do we preserve privacy? So these are all issues we're still uh, very much working on. How do you have a better, uh, how do we enable a better human computer uh, collaborative process so that we can both do tasks better, but also improve models? So this is, again, uh, people working in this area uh, with, um, for example, reinforcement learning for human feedback is such an example, uh, and other human in the loop uh, approaches. And of course, we have the resolution of comp complex linguistic phenomena. And in all of this time comes time sensitivity. So how do you incorporate temporal information? How do you make sure that your, ro your models are robust to, um, to changes over time? So, so this has been, this is kind of, this is the introduction. So now I want to talk about some uh, learning paradigms, tasks, um, in NLP more broadly. So like in machine learning, um, in natural language processing these days, a computer learns to address a task without being explicitly programmed. And then you have machine learning algorithms and the machine learning algorithms are used to train machine learning models. And then the learning paradigm is the learning setup, which it also includes not only the algorithm and the model, but also the data representation. So, so basically the general learning paradigm in NLP has been that you have some corpus of textual data, you present it in a way that can be fed into an algorithm uh, that trains a model, and then you, evalu you evaluate model performance and through um, and you can keep a part of your data so that you have an intermediate evaluation, so your, your development data set to tune further the parameters of the model. So that's basically been the general statistical NLP learning paradigm. So what is really key here is actually the text representation. So before 2013, when we started having word to vec uh, there was a lot of text pre-processing and feature engineering. 
and also selecting what, what features are best. And this has now been replaced with representation learning, which you get either essentially from pre-trained language models. Um, so we generally don't do much text pre-processing, but even, um, even the uh, transformers and pre-trained language models will definitely do tokenization. But yeah, there, there's things like, um, depending on the application, you may want to do some other kinds of, of pre-processing. So um, what we used to do in the past is we used to have one hot vectors. So uh, that, that meant that you took your vocabulary and you basically um, said, um, for, for each of, this, of the sentences you wanted to represent, you gave a zero or a one uh, to the vectors. So you had, you had this kind of big matrix where your vocabulary was in your rows and each sentence would be, uh, for example, your um, a, a vector of, of one and zeros, a very sparse vector of one and zeros to denote what, um, which, uh, which um, elements of the vocabulary were present in the sentence. So for example, um, I like cats and dogs, it would be this kind of uh, representation in the middle of sentence one. Uh, of course, this, this kind of um, bag of word representation is very high dimensional and very sparse. Uh, and of course, the dimensionality depended on the vocabulary size. And the, the relations between words were not captured. Information about word, uh, word order was, was not preserved. So people used to move on from uh, the bag of words representation anyway based on the distributional hypothesis, which was uh, basically used to for many years as a way to reduce the dimension of the sparse vocabulary. So doing some kind of matrix decomposition to actually obtain projections of the sparse uh, word vector, these very sparse matrices into lower dimension, dense semantic spaces. So these kinds of projection, for projections of word vectors are called embeddings. So, um, so this is kind of the revolutionary 2013 paper by Mikolov on, on, on obtaining. So, so embeddings were being obtained in different ways before, but um, this was a, um, this, this kind of very new efficient uh, approach, which uses um, a kind of a trick in machine learning. So you basically, um, you have a simple neural network with a single hidden layer, and uh, you basically train it to perform a simple task. You don't need any labels. And the task is to um, give in a particular word, to predict word, the other words, the probability of uh, words in its context. And so that was the training task. But you don't actually use the model to perform the task. You actually use... Um, you, you use the weights that you've learned in the hidden layer. So this is essentially what you, what you the weights are your embeddings. Um, so, um, and this, this kind of type of, um, so given a specific word, word in the middle of a sentence, you look at the words nearby and then uh, the network is going to tell us the probability for every word in our vocabulary. That's been sort of the, the training task. This was kind of the skip gram approach, but it's also what is uh, the fundamental of the mask, um, the mask language model training strategy of transformers. So it's been uh, very, uh, very important. And of course, there was also uh, SIBO, which did kind of the opposite of skip gram. So given the context, so you were trying to predict a word in the middle. So, um, so the really nice properties of these of kind of uh, embedding vectors that were learned in this way was that um, the words and the phrases are now mapped. You have a much lower dimensional space. So you basically specify uh, beforehand what kind of dimensional ending matrix you want for all of your vocabulary. Uh, so uh, you could have typically something like 300, 700 um, dimensions. And, um, and each dimension of a feature vector is a latent feature. 
and it's now all real numbers, of course. Um, so the other nice property was that these, um, these kind of vectors also captured semantics. So it was actually possible to do simple operations with these uh, embedding vectors and get, for example, that if you took the embedding vector of Paris, um, say Pi Paris, um, Paris minus France plus Italy will give you Rome. So, so, so essentially, this was a you know, a really nice uh, property of these of these vectors. So, what are the kind of um, tasks? So, what is it like the? I told you about the applications, but what are kind of the? How can you view uh, the tasks at a higher at a yeah the higher level in terms of what is at a lower level rather in terms of what is needed? So, for example, you need to you have tasks where there's a one-to-one -one mapping between your input and your output. So you have, a, for example, a classification where you have um, one word and you want to give it one label. Um, for example, uh, you could view a sentence as an entity uh, and you give it a, um, a label positive in sentiment analysis. Uh, you can have one-to-many, so uh, in, in generation tasks. So you start with, for example, the, the first word, I, and then you want to generate, I'm so happy. Okay, so that's kind of the, um, what language models are doing, more or less. Um, then you have many to one. So for example, you can view um, the sentence as a sequence of words, and uh, you I use a sequential model and finally give this label of happy rather than taking it all together as, as one entity. Uh, and then you can have many to many. So uh, this can be, this is the example of, of translation, uh, whereas there's not always a direct mapping between your, um, the sentence that is being encoded, the input sentence and the output sentence. And then you can also have many to many where there is a direct mapping. So everything in a sequence receives a label. So these, I would say, are kind of the core types of tasks that you get uh, in NLP. Um, and the kind of the kinds of architectures, I mean, these days, pretty much all of the approaches are, are neural. Um, for a long time, support, support vector machines and uh, random forests and logistic regression were very strong baselines and still some people will use them as baselines if they're proposing a new task. Um, but uh, for example, the for class for the classification task, um, a BERT transformer model will be kind of the go-to um, uh, the go-to baseline. And then there's kind of more sequential classifiers, uh, which range from uh, RNNs and then now um, hierarchical transformers. Um, and, and, and indeed, these days, uh, different transformer architectures. Of course, uh, a lot of it is being uh, now dominated by large language models, which um, the next speaker will talk more about, but which are themselves very large um, transformers. And of course, as with any task, you need to have some kind of evaluation strategy. So, um, you have your training, depending, let's say you have a classification task, you have a training development test set or cross-validation. And again, depending now on the task, there's different kinds of evaluation metrics. Uh, so you'll have different kinds of evaluation metrics for, let's say, summarization and, uh, and machine translation and uh, different tasks, obviously, for uh, things like um, the text classification. So very briefly, uh, the very standard evaluation metrics in, um, in cl text classification uh, are accuracy, precision, recall, and F1, where, which are all based on um, the true positives, false positives, and false negatives. Uh, so your precision is your true positives over true positives and false positives, whereas recall true positive over true positive and false negatives, and then you have the harmonic mean in the F1. So um, I'll say 
a few things about pre-trained language models because I don't think anyone cannot talk about them these days. So most of the research in NLP these days involves working with pre-trained language models and um, they perform a variety of tasks from classification to generation tasks. So typically a pre-trained language model is, learn, is trained to learn the associations in data through different kinds of strategies. And again, without any labels. So the training strategies, as I told you before, with a word to vex skipgram, so the um, mass language modeling uh, pre-training is very much kind of the, the standard and variant of this exist. So you have, um, you have your original text, you, some words are hidden, and the goal of the model is to learn to predict the missing words. So this is the masked language modeling, and uh, you you don't require any any labels. It's all pre-trained on large text. And then the great benefit of this is that downstream tasks can make use of the pre-trained language models and fine tune on the on the smaller uh, specific task that you have. So in this example I have here. Um, So you have um, it's a uh, movie in in in, uh, in every Picard and mass painful to watch. So basically, your model will learn to predict things like terrible and utterly, and then you use this model that's been trained in this way. And usually, the masking can be random, uh, and or they can be um, other. Um, other learning strategies, other masking strategies. Uh, and then when you're fine tuning, you're, uh, you're performing kind of your more standard uh, model training, uh, but now you've got a model that's, that's basically um, seen a lot more data. Uh, and so it's just adjust, adjusting it to your, um, your text classification. And then, um, People found that that actually that actually you could bring your fine-tuning task closer to the mass learn model uh, pre-training, and and that was the whole idea of pos posing tasks as uh, essentially um, templates, masking templates, which is what prompting is basically. So here, uh, oh, it's not showing it. So, uh, so here, what the the little bullet would, would have been saying is that here we'd have added a, a template that says it's a mask. So essentially, uh, when fine tuning, uh, you're you're now you're now essentially doing um, the same thing as with your mass language module <laughs> as your MLM. Uh, pre-training pre task. So you're actually bringing closer to um, this this label of negative to uh, the fact that the model has learned it's terrible. Um, and of course, the these the basis of the pre-trained language, mod language models are transformer networks, which I'm sure the next speaker will talk more about. Um, yeah, so, so the main thing I guess that I want to say about them is that they have an encoder and a decoder part, and um, the encoder part creates a contextual embedding of a series of data, and then the decoder takes, takes this embedding and creates a new series. And they're based heavily on the notion of position encodings and self-attention. So, um, so essentially, now you're able to deal with uh, with longer range um, uh, texts uh, without having sort of the um, a diminishing gradient effect that you had in, in RNNs. Uh, and so basically the self-attention mechanism relates different, position, different positions of a single sequence to computer representation of the sequence. And then you have uh, multi-head attention, which basically is uh, different self-attention layers 
stacked in parallel, um, where you have linear transformations of the same input attending to different positions um, dominated by the same word. So there are many pre-trained language models. Um, so um, BERT still remains uh, the, kind of the, the go-to baselines for most researchers. Um, it's easily embeddable in your applications and the focus is on the encoder and it's best for classification. And then we also see that the kind of large language models that have come out recently, and this is only a small example because there's been an avalanche of language models since um, February last, since uh, November last year, are much larger in size um, and they focus more um, on the decoder and the generation. So, um, but the interesting thing is that um, ChatGPT, which has been, uh, which is trained to focus on question answering and uh, an interaction, um, has fewer parameters. So there is a trend to actually go for more specialized, slightly smaller models. Um, well, quite a lot, quite a lot smaller than than the original GPT three point five. Um, so, what are these uh, large language models good at? They well, they can be very uh, good at capturing higher order co-occurrences in text. Uh, they generate very fluent text in several languages. They're excellent at paraphrasing. Um, they are very good at short, coherent summaries. And, and of course, in generating creative content. Um, so um, you can have lots of fun making poems um, with systems like ChatGPT. But they're not good at all at factuality, um, biases, hallucinations, um, information, low, low resource domains, they're not very good with. Um, reasoning inference and complex semantic similarity, summarizing long documents and also temporality uh, and temporal robustness. So all of these are areas that people are very much working on. Um, I just, this was just an example um, of some of these issues. Uh, so for example, here I had asked, um, this was actually quite a simple, uh, semantic similarity issue. So I'd asked it, are there any nice beaches near Petalidi, and uh, which is a place in the Peloponnese where I was on holiday. Um, and it gave you a number of beaches and say all of these beaches are located within 30 minute drive from Petalidi and of a beautiful clear water. And then I asked it, I give it again the sentence, the first sentence, are there any good beaches near Petalidi? And then I give it the name of one of the beaches it just gave me. And as sentence two, so and I say Franny is very good. And I asked it if sentence two provides an answer to sentence one. So obviously it does provide an answer. But then it's 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 told me it doesn't provide an answer. Uh, and one of the reasons it gave me was that it's located in Messinia, which is a different region of Greece. Ah, sorry, yes. So um so obviously it could not, uh, this is much better. It could not find the similarity, uh, what, what near really meant. So even though it had told me that these beaches were within 30 minutes, uh, it hadn't linked this to actually it being near. Um, they're constantly improving. So every time we, uh, I don't even know whether that's still a problem uh, because they are constantly improving with all of our testing. Um, but another example was uh, with long document summarization. Um, here it's um, it's someone's um, it's a summary of um, someone's social media thread, and um, this person is depressed. And one of the issues is that it kind of fails to capture uh, what are important events in this thread, uh, and also it's uh, rather than summarizing, it does a lot of paraphrasing. So it's repeating a lot. So that's kind of another problem. So 
Um, so with this in mind, I'm kind of moving to the to the work that we're doing as a group on personalized longitudinal natural language processing. So um, we're motivated by several things and challenges with sensitive data. So um, for once, you can't use pre-trained language models that you can't control yourself, that you don't have, um, you don't know how it's been trained. And unfortunately, uh, we don't know very much about um, what data these um, large language models are trained on. Um, we, um, in long sequences, um, generated summaries don't capture the most important events or preserve the temporal order. So that's a, another thing that motivates the kind of work we're doing. Uh, they're not temporally robust. Uh, there's hallucinated information, and there's no preservation of individual style. So um, if you're looking at, um, for example, understanding someone with, with a mental health issue, the, the disfluencies and, and, and sort of generating these uh, is, is quite important. So this is a, a kind of a program of work that is concerned with capturing changes in individuals over time through their language and other digital content they share, uh, they produce uh, online. And um, it's a collaboration with uh, people who work in NLP, mathematics, statistics, social sciences, psychology, and psychiatry. So a key um, kind of concept in this work is that, um, is that of user-generated content. So as individuals, we continuously produce large amounts of digital content. And this can be textual data in social media, but as also uh, language and other data from um, other devices, such as computers, tablets, um, fitness devices, and so on. And we call this data user-generated content. And in this term, we also include um, uh, that data that's recorded uh, on devices using face-to-face uh, -face interaction. So for example, we have uh, people who have dementia who use a daily tablet to record conversations they have with their carers. And all of this data contains behavioral cues uh, through the language, but also other information. So what we, uh, what we aim to do is develop um, a framework for establishing and um, understanding changes in individuals over time through language and other heterogeneous content, and especially developing methods for capturing changes in individuals' language over time. So then what we want is to have uh, sensors that use these methods for capturing changes in language to be able to understand the evolution of an individual over time. And we want to apply this technology particularly to mental health. So we work with a lot of kind of mental health data sets and use cases. For example, this work can help with diagnosis and ongoing monitoring. Um, and so for, for people who have um, either cognition changes for so people with dementia, but also mood instability. So um, to someone, for example, who has bipolar disorder, you should be it would be useful if you have an application on your phone or your computer that combines information from your language and other um, digital content and so that it can alert you that uh, a manic um, phase may be imminent or manic or depressive phase so that's the kind of um, um, the ambition and the and the goal in this and um, and in terms of how it connects to core challenges in NLP uh, it were it deals with um, a challenge of uh, small data uh, transferring across domains, um, obtaining useful interpretable representations, privacy preservation, um, and collaborative human computer process. So, uh, and of course, temporal sensitivity. So, what we um, want to do is be able to identify changes over time. So that's kind of a big theme in in what we're doing. So, um, so one uh, major objective is ha is creating time sensitive representations from the language and other digital content, and typically this is not something you have uh, in in your standard NLP methodology. Um, so usually you have your uh, vector represented through some kind of uh, pre-trained language model, 
And what we want is this kind of representation of individual through both the language and the, the heterogeneous content where the streams are asynchronous. So we're looking in, in terms of how you kind of create these uh, representations that are asynchronous. But most of the effort um, has gone into identifying um, normal states and anomalies. So um, how we identify the changes in the represent. So given the representation of an individual, how you identify a change in this representation. Um, so, and I'll talk uh, more, I'll go into a bit more depth um, uh, regarding this, this kind of line of work. Um, Another important objective is how you address sparsity in real world longitudinal data sets uh, while also respecting ethical issues. So uh, for a start, there are not many longitudinal data sets that also have uh, labels. Uh, so we, um, we've been working with uh, a number of such data sets and they vary from being very fine grained, uh, sort of smaller data sets that are very fine grained and, and contain heterogeneous sources. So they could have, for example, both uh, speech and um, um, data about uh, uh, people, keystrokes and pen strokes when they're using certain devices um, to uh, much larger scale social media data sets stemming from talk life and mumsnet and reddit and and what we're doing is we're um we're working on both uh, annotation of these but also on how you um can generate synthetic data from these so that you can augment the amount of information you have um you, you can augment the labeled annotated data uh, and also you can share this kind of sensitive data because this is um uh, it's um whereas in, in the past um also with social media data it was uh okay to to share data sets this is this is coming becoming less and less uh, possible um see what's happening with twitter for example so uh so the generation of um synthetic language data uh is that is actually reliable and corresponds to uh, ground truth values is important. And then finally, uh, another line of work that we've been um, working with in the group is, uh, is summarization, explainability, and interventions. So, um, so far we've been working on different kinds of summarization methods for, for multi-document opinion summarization in social media. And we're also extending these methods to uh, long documents. So uh, to tackle the problem of uh, summarizing really long timelines. And also looking at how you use summaries as, as explanations. So um, I'll now zoom in uh, into some of the work uh, more specifically on identifying moments of change from longitudinal user text. So this was uh, from ACL last year. Um, so um, an important notion here is what we consider to be a moment of change. So you have a sequence of posts and interactions uh, between two moments in, of time, which we call a timeline. Um, and then um, a change um, can be, um, a change after a particular event or a particular uh, or, or a trend or a symptom onset. But here in the particular context, we're looking at um, uh, change, a change in mood. So uh, we are focusing uh, very much on drastic changes. So where someone's mood goes uh, very quickly from uh, positive to negative ne or negative to positive, uh, or uh, more gradual escalation. So someone's mood deteriorates um, and or, or improves. So we have these kinds of uh, two different types of changes. So one is drastic and the other one is, um, is gradual. So the switches and the escalations. So to illustrate an example of this, so uh, of an escalation. Um, so you have, let's assume that this is a, a timeline, this kind of 
um, this little uh, sequence there is a timeline, and uh, these are all of these squares are uh, posts, and then um, kind of the um, this one is quite a neutral post, so gonna be offline for a bit, having lunch lunch at the moment. Okay, I'm back, kind of bored. Um, and then it starts deteriorating. So everything is so wrong in my life. Oh my God, I can't stop crying. Everything is ruined. Need someone, please, uh, before I do something stupid. So please help. So that's kind of the peak of the escalation. And then you have a de-escalation, like I wish things were different. So, so these are the kinds of things that we want to capture. We want to be able to, ca to capture these kind of ranges. Um, and I guess there's different ways of how you could operationalize this problem. So how you how you formulate this as a problem. Um, and uh, the, the way we decided to approach it as a, was a, um, as a three label uh, post level classification task where each post uh, was uh, labeled as being in a switch in an escalation or neither. And then um, kind of the idea was was then to be able to identify kind of these um these regions uh now one thing to note is that these these kinds of phenomena the escalations and the switches are very rare so um so switches account for about five to six percent so this is if if you look at both talk life and reddit for example um of the of a person's timeline escalations are, are between 11 to 16 percent um so you could um you'd you could have a, a classifier performing well on predicting the majority uh class but actually this is not what you're interested in oh. so um so it's like So it's a very um yeah um it's it's very rare very rare and imbalanced uh, kind of the, the classes um so it's more like an outlier detection task and so the solution is to actually um uh cater for the um for the for the imbalance and this can be through the uh the choice of your loss so, for example, the focal loss versus the cross entropy loss, um, and then there's also the issue around um, using information in the context. So, single post classification lacks the context of the post. So, essentially, you have to um, to use an approach that will work with the long sequences. So, here we, in this case, we used um, RNNs. And we viewed this as a single post um, timeline based task. So sequential task where you get a, a label at, at each post. Now, one of the issues here uh, is how you actually evaluate, um, how you evaluate a timeline based um, task. So if you have, uh, let's say here, Two timelines. So this is, uh, let's suppose this is a uh, your ground truth, and this is the labels uh, given to your timeline by some kind of uh, model. Um, and this, uh, so the orange are the uh, escalation labels, and the switches are the switch labels, and gray is none. Now, you see that this system captures some of the um, some of the phenomena, but kind of misses uh, the range. And then you have the same ground truth timeline. Uh, and here, what you what you see is there's um, this uh, machine, uh, this model captures better the, the kind of the regions, but it's slightly, um, 
going kind of ahead. Now, if you use your standard recall precision F1 metrics, the first system will always up, the system will always outperform this one. So it's really important on how you choose the right metrics. Oh, oh. Uh, how do I bring it back again? So um, the solution we gave was to consider uh, metrics from different areas. So we looked at window-based metrics, which comes from the field of uh, change point detection. And so essentially you, you allow basically your, uh, when you're counting your true positives and false positives and false negatives, you, uh, you give yourself a lax of a certain window size. And here it was a window of one. But then this still doesn't help you with identifying the regions. So how kind of, kind of you identify uh, the shape, right? So how do you identify whether something captures the shape well? Uh, and here we looked at coverage-based metrics, which comes from uh, vision and uh, segmentation, image segmentation. Uh, and so we, um, so basically this looks at um, the overlap between the, the predicted region and the, the actual region. And then uh, you basically sum over um, the, the number of, of ground truth regions for a recall, and then for the number of predicted regions for the precision-based coverage metric. So anyway, I'm not going to go through uh, the results in detail because they're in a uh, paper, uh, but I think you know the main take home message is that um, basically the, the approach that considers uh, both the focal loss and uh, the sequential nature does better in, uh, in all kinds of metrics. And especially if you, if you look at the, the coverage based metrics, um, so, um, I mean, what, what you're really interested in, as I said, is not your performance in the none class, but how you do in the, in the difficult rare classes. Uh, and then there was a, a shared task uh, again last year, uh, which uh, also looked at how you connect these kinds of, um, detecting these, these kinds of regions to, um, uh, to real world assessment of uh, clinical issues such as um, suicidal risk. And, uh, and again, sort of this, this basically confirmed uh, the, the importance of, of capturing these regions. Um, but what, um, what is kind of um, remaining and, and sort of something that we were looking into at the moment and came out from our error analysis um, was that, um, Basically, we we have um, we we seem to be uh, predicting. We we seem to be um, capturing like a common. Uh, um, we're not we're not capturing the the personalized uh, normal baseline of individuals. So it seems like the model is actually learning that people are usually uh, sad in these kinds of contexts. And so if someone uh, seems happy, so stay safe, you lovely people all around, this is predicted as a switch uh, because it has a baseline of a negative baseline for, for this population. Um, and, uh, and indeed, uh, this one is, is kind of negative. Um, and um, this was a person who was happy before and is becoming negative and the system thinks, oh, well, this is our baseline negativity here and doesn't actually predict it as a switch. So the work we're, we're, we're doing now is actually in, in personalizing these models and sort of looking at, so how do we better personalize the models? Um, 
how am I doing for time? So maybe I'll, I'll talk a little bit about um, another approach to again the same problem, uh, but but allowing more of uh, incorporation of uh, temporality. So uh, so in our previous uh, task we didn't uh, it was a sequential uh, timeline based approach where the evaluation was uh, time based but we didn't have an explicit way of telling the system uh, for example how close these uh, different time points were uh, which actually makes uh, is important in terms of uh, of sort of predicting these kinds of phenomena so this was presented at ACL this year and um, kind of the the idea is uh, we start with a raw timeline of user posts and um, we basically encode the post embeddings uh, in a sort of standard way since in this way it was uh, sentence spread uh, and we um, we we lower the dimensionality further so here um, we want to have uh, two ways of actually of actually capturing the temporality. So one is looking at um, a a window of five posts going zooming in into a short window of five posts, and then also having kind of a longer overview of what is happening in the timeline. So uh, so we have basically two different kinds of of temporal components here. So one is our um, sign signature network unit, and the other one, which looks at each, um, it looks at a, a sliding uh, five post window, and then uh, creates a representation of each of these windows. And then these are fed into kind of the bio SDN. And then this uh, provides kind of a compression of the time injection. So for each, basically, uh, post, uh, you provide like a, a temporal compression uh, of, all, of all the context around it in these two different ways, and uh, and the current post in order to have a, a better informed decision uh, in terms of how you classify a certain post. So this kind of uh, differs from the previous approach in that you don't have a sequential model that is looking at each po um, post individually. Uh, but is uh, rather uh, classifying each post, but uh, creating a temporal compression of uh, the context uh, before it in two different ways of zooming in uh, temporally. Um, so, oh, this is not. So the, the kind of um, novelty of this approach, signature network unit. So uh, signatures are essentially, um, uh, they're, they're, they're learnable, um, they're, they're ways of summarizing uh, sequential data uh, and they're based on rough path theory. Uh, and they are applied uh, over local expanding windows and um, they're basically fed into an LSTM to model the progression of a user's content. And then, so what is happening in the, in your sort of five uh, sliding window, you have kind of, you're expanding uh, your window uh, getting sort of these kinds of uh, you can you can th think of these as as integrals so you're having uh, successive integrals within this five window compressing them together and then you're creating kind of the history of the of your window and then you you kind of stack these um so uh, when we compared this to kind of our, our previous approaches, uh, we, we basically, um, so we found that 
uh, we we kind of reach state of the art performance uh, with this this new approach, uh, and then um, one advantage this has is the previous approach was also looking at um, information in the future, whereas this is uh, only looking at information in the past. So it's actually applicable in real time. Um, and it didn't use any uh, emotion features with some of the other baselines did. And um, another kind of interesting aspect to it is that it's uh, less memory hungry uh, with uh, <clears throat> and using, uh, using uh, fewer parameters and uh, shorter training time. So, um, and we saw that actually, yes, the benefits from this came from this new unit. So I think that maybe uh, rather than going into the next piece of work, uh, I'd like to stop here and, and take questions. Um, so I think that's, we've got uh, 15 minutes uh, for questions.